Request everyone to be seated. I also request everyone to keep their phones on silent. Good evening, one and all. The evening that we have been waiting for is finally here. We hope you enjoy it as much as we have enjoyed putting it together. It is my privilege to welcome all of you to this function. I would first like to welcome the dignitaries to the dais. We are happy to have with us Honorable Justice Ravindra Bhatt, Judge Supreme Court of India. Sir, please. Justice Bhatt was previously judge of the Delhi High Court and the High Court of Rajasthan. In the Supreme Court, he has been part of several important ventures, such as distribution of COVID vaccines to the people. He has passed many landmark judgments, including the one that holds that the Supreme Court is subject to the Right to Information Act. He was among one of the first judges who was asked not to, who had asked people not to address him as your lordship. Next, I would like to welcome Ms. Indra Jai Singh, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court. <laughs> Ms. Jai Singh has many firsts to her name. She was the first woman to be designated as a senior advocate in the Bombay High Court and also the first female additional solicitor general from the year 2009 to the year 2014. She is the founder of Lawyers Collective. Under the banner of Lawyers Collective, she has campaigned for law reform, for women empowerment, in particular law relating to domestic violence and law relating to sexual harassment. She has many articles and publications to her credit and a new venture, The Leaflet, which has very kindly partnered with us for the promotion of this book. Next, I would like to welcome Mr. Dhyan Krishnan. Mr. Krishnan. <laughs> Mr. Krishnan is a senior advocate at the Delhi High Court. He has argued many high profile cases such as the Nirbhaya rape case and the appeal in the Nitish Katara case. He was also part of the prosecution team in the parliament attack case. He was also part of the Indian team that was allowed to interview David Headley in the US post 26-11. Next, we are happy to have with us our moderator for the night, Mr. Akash Banerjee. Mr. Banerjee is a satirist and political com uh, commentator who runs the YouTube channel The Desh Bhakt, which has close to 2.5 million followers from all walks of life. In words of Akash, in his previous life, he was a journalist with Times Now, and he has also authored the book Tales from Shining and Sinking India. And finally, a very, very warm welcome to the man of the moment, the struggling author, <laughs> Mr. Sanjay Ghosh. Mm. Mm. Mr. Sanjay Ghosh is a senior advocate at the Delhi High Court. He has been part of the process initiated for the introduction of law on domestic violence and sexual harassment of women at workplace, which ultimately resulted in the enactment of the, of the respective legislations in the year 2005 and the year 2013. Although he has authored many articles and opinion pieces, Gorongo is his first novel. I would also like to welcome Mr. Sumit Malik, director EBC, who has played <laughs> um, 
who has played an instrumental role in bringing Eastern Book Company's first legal fiction to the masses. It is also gratifying to have in the audience among us Justice Lokur, Justice Midha, and Justice Jalan. A warm welcome to them and to all our guests. I would like to first call upon Mr. Vijay Malik, Managing Director, Eastern Book Company, to please welcome Justice Bhatt. Next, I would like to call upon Mr. Sumain Malik, Executive Director, Eastern Book Company, to welcome Ms. Jay Singh. <laughs> Mr. Raghunandan Malik, Director, EBC, to welcome Mr. Dayan Krishnan. Mr. Abhinandan Malik, Director, Eastern Book Company, to welcome Mr. Akash Banerjee. <laughs> Last, I would like to request Mr. Sumit Malik, Associated Editor, Supreme Court Cases, to welcome the author, Mr. Sanjay Ghosh. A big thank you to all the panelists for gracing us with your presence this evening. From just an idea in the author's head to a printed copy in our hands, a manuscript travels a long way. Although much of the effort is by the author, but the publishers too put in their fair share of effort to bring out a copy which is edited to perfection, error free and a joy to read. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Sumit Malik, Director EBC, who are the publishers of the book, to say a few words. At this uh, EBC event, I do hope that all of you know that what we are about to present is a work of fiction and that all the characters in the book are a result of the author's imagination. Any resemblance to any person, dead or alive, is purely co coincidental. I also understand from my team that no animals were hurt during the publishing of this book. <laughs> I'm not too sure about the writing. Uh, rumor has it, and it is probably as imaginary as the characters in this book, that the author had sent an article to be published in Supreme Court cases, to which, in this audience, I don't know, I hope, need to make an introduction to SEC, Allegedly, that article was not accepted for publication. EBC, SCC, and me especially became persona non grata for our esteemed author. Incidentally, Mr. Ghosh and I went to the same law school, and he was my senior by three years. Our time in law school was very cordial. But I must say, my dear audience, that our world is indeed circular. A mutual law school friend about a year and a half ago mentioned to me that Mr. Ghosh had written a fictional autobiography of an imaginary lawyer and a first draft did land in my mailbox. This time, I made my mother read it. She, having instilled the love of reading in all of us, if she found it interesting, would be the test. After having read the book, she told me that she had a smile on her face and a tear in her eye, enough validation for Gorongo to come to life. Justice Ravindra Bhatt, uh, Judge, Supreme Court of India, Ms. Indra Jai Singh, Senior Advocate, Mr. Dayan Krishnan, Senior Advocate, our author, Shonjoy Ghosh, Senior Advocate, and Mr. Akash Banerjee, satirist, judges, present, and former of the Supreme Court, High Court, Senior Advocates, Advocates, and gentle people. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to the book release of How Gorongo Lost His O. I am indeed grateful to Justice Bhatt, our chief guest, and all the panelists for making time today. Akash is my junior from Lamatnia, Lucknow, and I'm sure that his questions and comments will add a different perspective to the discussion later. 
Strange things happen when a law publisher is presented with a manuscript which is neither a section-by-section -section commentary of an act or a topic-wise tome to an area of law, but in the author's own words, musing of a struggling lawyer during COVID. You still get a book, very nicely produced, beautiful illustrations on the cover, extremely well edited, but still a book. Publishing is what EBC has been doing for the last many years, now 80. Starting with a book on the dreaded control orders in 1947, to over 600 titles now covering nearly every area of law and aspect of law, right from class 11 till you become a member of the profession and beyond, EBC has a book. We've been privileged to publish autobiographies of many, including the great Justice Khanna and many biographies. But why this book? I believe that a good story must be told and Shonjoy has written a good story. And if it could bring both joy and poignancy to my mother, then it must be, pardon my French, a bloody good one. The way, that is what we see our role as publishers, to make great material and present it in an excellent way. As a third generation member of this organization, I have been blessed to be shown the way by my elders. My grand uncle and grandfather had very humble beginnings, del delivering books on cycles to lawyers when they started off. But the mission was clear, provide a service which, is, which will assist the lawyer in her work, the mission continued with the same spirit when EBC started publishing books for lawyers and students. The books we produced must be of a high quality and assist the user in their quest for knowledge. It was this very spirit that led to the starting of Supreme Court cases in 1969 by my father, Mr. Sarain Malik. This spirit and vision continues to this day with all the members of the family bringing back with them their expertise and innovation that we are able to give to the profession SCC Online, the EBC Web Store, the EBC Reader, the SCC Online Blog, and our latest offerings, EBC Learning and Mercury. We are also fortunate that as part of the EBC family, a dedicated team of legal editors, software engineers, DTP staff, proofreaders, sales and marketing staff and managers who are as much, if not sometimes, more invested in ensuring that what is produced from the house of EBC is of high quality, authentic, accurate, and reliable. It has been a wonderful experience working with Shonjai on this book, and I can only hope that the number of copies already ordered will inspire him to write another non-story. It has been a pleasure and privilege to be your publisher. It would be a miss if I did not mention the contribution of my younger sister, Supriya, who after a bit of goading, put her heart and soul in editing the book. The result is now before you. I must also acknowledge and appreciate the efforts of Bhumika, Nilfar, and Prachi who have been working on organizing this event and all the publicity related to this event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malik. Next, I would like to call upon Justice Bhatt to officially release the book. I would also request all panelists to open the packages in front of them and hold the book up in their hands. Thank you, everyone. Now I would like to invite Justice Bhatt. Sir, if you could please say a few words on the occasion. Good evening, Ms. Indra Jaising. Mr. Dayan Krishnan, Mr. Akash Banerjee, Mr. Sumit Malik, Justice Lokur, Justices Midha and Jalan, the audience, members present here, all of them friends of, many of them, most of them rather, friends of Sanjoy, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here and be given the honor of releasing 
How Goranga Lost His O, authored by Sanjoy, who has ventured into what I hope will be a parallel career in an entirely new genre of fiction. Having the benefit of an advanced copy, I read through the whole book. I know that one of the panelists today is going to read excerpts, yet I cannot resist the impulse of making some observations which I hope will not overlap with his. At first, what strikes the reader is the vivid portraiture of each character. The central protagonist, so to speak, in a very loose sense, is the litigant Noor, whose plight most of us lawyers, uh, perhaps a vanishing breed of lawyers known as labor and service lawyers, would be familiar with. The retrofitting of a norm created in terms of you know, qualifying qualifications. You create an uh, educational qualification, but don't apply it in present, but also apply it to existing uh, employees. This results in poor Noor's uh, employment being jeopardized. His whole career is, at, is, is, is uh, endangered, so to speak. The other uh, vivid and detailed portraits are that of his lawyer, Keshtoda. His name is something else, but this is his Dhaka, Dhaka name Dhaka. we are told, Dhaka. dark name. And in the latter part of the book, the powerful senior of Gorongo. In between, there are exquisite pen pictures of characters whom we daily encounter in courts. Snigdha Swarkar, the optimist who dreamt of becoming a doctor but had to settle, up, settle being a court steno. Narendra, or Nuru, I think, whose dreams of being a playback singer of the stature of Kishorda shattered and he went on to become a resentful, perhaps even a spiteful court master. The surprising thing about the portrayal, apart from the vividity in them, is the ability of the author to show the world through the lens of each character, and thus lay open to us their unique perspectives. Contrary to expectations, the narrative and the tone adopted by the author is one of sympathy, and at its worst, and I use the word intendedly, at its worst, gentle irony. Never do you encounter the tone of sarcasm or scorn towards lawyers, judges, or situations, whether in Kolkata or in, De in Delhi, which is where eventually Gorongo becomes Gorang. His practice in Delhi and the experiences he goes through, strung together, form the latter part of the book, which is equally absorbing. I do not recollect having read legal fiction from Indian authors of our times the likes of which Sanjoy has offered to his readers. The fictional works we come across are all of accounts of trials or such. I recollect Henry Cecil, who has written about 15 or 20 short novels depicting various situations in the law, again with a lot of vivid portrayal of characters, and also the famous Sir John Mortimer's character Rampol, which was perhaps more popular in my generation. In that sense, what the author has offered to us readers is a new kind of writing which gives non-legal writers, readers, an insight into the legal world, which from the litigant's point of world uh, view, view can be bewildering, even terrifying. Like all other professions who have their special lingos and special terms, the legal profession is no exception. You choose to revel in it. The Latin maxims, the here to after, the here and before, the ultimo, the ante, and so on and so forth. The author has underlined the utter disconnect between the society that we live in and the language of the world, legal world that we inhabit with its archaic lingo, which, which, which would make Sir Ernest Gowers of the complete plain words fame turn in his grave. Be it in Keshtudas' resentment of wearing robes, the pathos of his empty existence, Noor's bewilderment upon encountering the rituals and rites of litigation, the tension which lawyers feel as, as their cases approach a hearing, and the pr pressure of work which judges experience and therefore have to prepare themselves to beforehand in order to get through the day's work are all captured in their minutest detail. We encounter 
as it were, sights, smells, even the taste. We are told of the samosas and the chai, which is a ubiquitous presence in all court complexes. In, in other words, the entire ecosystem of the court is captured. I would not like to speak further, but only to say that having known Sanjoy for the last 25 years, witnessing his journey from an intern, uh, a bubbly intern, full of enthusiasm, into a promising junior. <laughs> on, on the word junior, Sanjoy has a very interesting take, and I, I, I think I'll, I'll read that. Uh, let me not resist the urge to read it. I will read it to you. Uh, probably it is in page 14 or some, something like that. This is what he says. Uh, yes. He talks of Keshto who having some juniors, uh, giving gyan to his juniors who are a captive audience. Junior, and this is I think coming straight from the author, Incidentally is a word now frowned upon in legal circles, much like spinster, actress, disabled, and the like. The juniors may not have been successful in fighting the measly stipends they were paid by senior lawyers under the guise of following an ancient colonial tradition called deviling. They have managed to pariah the term junior for the politically kosher associate or colleague. I'm guessing comrade would have a Soviet feel to it and hence is avoidable. <laughs> so these are the kind of, uh, you know, gems you encounter in this book. So his journey from a promising junior, then to a senior lawyer as a senior counsel. Now you see him in his irrepressible best at the present day. He has never failed to delight. That he has chosen to write fiction is perhaps surprising. Yet the sensitivity which he has brought to the fore in portraying the characters he has created speaks a lot about the author himself. I congratulate you, Sanjoy, and wish you success in your second chosen career hereafter. Kudos to the publisher, EBC, that venerable journal which has ventured so far only into the field of law. It's, uh, for, uh, you have dared to take up this venture, and I wish you success. It speaks volumes, no pun intended, to your faith in the work. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Bhatt. I am sure our audience is extremely eager to know more about this book. Please welcome Mr. Akash Banerjee, to read out some choices extract from this book. Justice Bhatt has said so many times, your other career, your second career, your alternate career, you get the drift where this is going at this point of time. So will it be as fruitful and as successful? Let's see. Um, Justice Bhatt actually mentioned uh, something that I was also going to touch upon, fortunately not the same uh, excerpts. Um, stories can be successful, stories can have a thrilling ending. Uh, we've all read John Grisham's, I'm sure. But when I got this, I was like, Achha, Indian version of John Grisham hai kya? But it so turns out that it is not an Indian version or you know, we, we import so many ideas from websites to business ideas. This is not that. Because for somebody who's interested in news and anybody who's interested in court proceedings and litigation and how justice is done, not done in this country, this is a very good primer over how the courts function. So you may or may not like the story. It's your, it's your, it's your own liking or disliking. That's up to you. But what you will like is the gems, uh, as uh, Justice Bhatt also uh, mentioned. I'm just going to read out two and a half pages, if you could just bear with me, to understand how this book actually gives you these gems. And that is what made it very fascinating for me to read. Of course, everybody wants a good story also. So we're talking about the protagonist, Noor. Noor is stuck. Uh, Noor has a case coming up. He's managed to um, at least get his case heard. On that fateful day, Noor bathed and said his prayers, and off he went to the bus stop. 
Sanika had packed some puffed rice for him to give him company on the long and arduous journey. The bus was waiting and Noor got in and sat right in the front, just behind the driver's seat. Now all he had to do was bear the bumpy road up to the ghat, across it and then take the waiting bus down to the national highway into the imperial city. Meanwhile, kilometers away, Keshto Babu was getting ready for court. Even though it had been decades, on the day of hearing of a new case, Keshto got butterflies in his stomach. He once confessed to his colleagues at the bar room, to his surprise, emboldened by his contrition, many lawyers in the table made similar confessions, so it was, he was not a freak after all. So he had read Noor's file thoroughly. While he may not have the photographic memory like the legends of the bar, he only needed, who only needed one glance, Keshto had a pretty good memory. Years of practice had taught him how to meaningfully prod through the many pages and volumes to spot the target much like a shikari and his crouching tiger hidden in the tall grass. He had also another urgent case listed in another courtroom for a long time Marwari client of his, Jagannath Poddar. The fellow wanted a stay order on the electricity department's power disconnection notice for one of his shell units. Keshto had no doubt that he had to give priority to this case. Every lawyer has to make this painful decision. It's normal for their profession, much like a doctor has to choose which patient to attend to first. Well, in the case of lawyers, it may not always be the danger to life that would decide that priority. There are many factors behind the decision of the lawyer. Which judge would not mind accommodating a request to defer the hearing? In which case the client had to come in personally? Was the client a one-off one or a long-term potential? Had the fees been paid in advance? In which case was more fees expected? Which was likely to get listed first? And would the judge be quick in disposing it? These were the sort of things that went behind deciding whether a case like Noor's would get priority over a case like Jagannath Poddar's. As fate would have it, the day of that day, the board collapsed. Now, this was a revelation for me, and we hear about rosters a lot these days anyways. As fate would have it, that day, the board collapsed, a term no doubt scary to some lucky who have so far avoided the tentacles of the law. It simply means that all cases listed before the judge were getting well over before the anticipated time. This could happen for a number of reasons. Every lawyer, more than the lawyer, his court clerk, does a mental mapping on how the day shall unfold. Already, an unofficial, unwritten reconner is available with each judge. Does he decide cases swiftly? Is he the one to go into details, hence takes a lot of time? Is he sharp? Is he quick? You get the drift. So the complete board collapsed on that fateful day when Noor was, uh, Noor's case was supposed to be heard. So I'm just cutting a few paragraphs through. And this is how the board collapsed and Keshto is just ru rushing into uh, the, uh, the, the courtroom. Panting, Keshto Banerjee burst into Basak's courtroom. It was airy and spacious with the veranda on the side from which the judge would enter the courtroom. Noor's case, Noor Malik versus State of West Bengal had been just called out by the court master in his booming voice. The random lawyer Jobu had entrapped was mumbling something when Keshto almost dashed in front of the courtroom. He was panting as he said, my lord, this is the case which chronicles, chronicles the injustice. He was completely out of breath. Mr. Banerjee, catch your breath, Justice Pasak said reassuringly, even asking the court attendant to give Keshto Babu some water. Keshto, feeling most embarrassed, drank the water, still panting, tried another attempt at speaking. My lord, this, at this time, it was not his breath that caused the interruption. It was the bench. Justice Pasak waved his hand, asking Keshto to pause. Mr. Banerjee, I have read your file. I have simply... I have sympathy for your client. However, the law is the law. He does not have the qualification to, but, but my Lord. At that instant, Keshto sensed his mistake. Never interrupt a judge. A judge hates nothing more than being interrupted. As part of the highest traditions of colonial litigation, the lawyer is allowed to hit out at the judge, but in a proper form. A little irritation would warrant a, my Lord, with respect, I want to submit. A greater irritation would justify with, with greatest respect, my lord, and so on and so forth, until the lawyer would reach with the utmost respect. 
neither the lawyer showing the respect nor the judge receiving the same would be under any delusion to what ex what exact content of this respect is but simply the way it had always been done the quaintest colonial form of advocacy is the conventional prohibition on the lawyer asking a judge any question you don't get to ask the questions we do the asking so the lawyer asks himself the question which he wants to be thrown at the judge with i ask myself the question my lord so it is these gems that make it so much of a value read whether you like the story as i said at the end of the day is completely up to you but what you will get is the peek into how courtrooms work what is the lingo how these things work which has made this book very fascinating for me thank you thank you akash for the enthralling performance next i would like to call upon the author to say a few words about his experience of writing his first novel and how he came up with this idea that this story needs to be told thank you akash that was most enthralling i almost forgot that i had wrote i had written those words uh well protocol requires me to first acknowledge and recognize justice bhat but i never followed protocol so i will just defer that for a moment let me acknowledge one lady over here who has battled covid who has battled dengue and more importantly has now battled 49 degrees of delhi temperature to stay back in delhi ms jay singh my senior and let me tell you why i deferred acknowledging justice bhat because i got justice bhat in my life only because of my senior and justice bhat used to come to brief ms jay singh when justice bhat was a lawyer and i realized that this is pre google pre scc online days so my google and scc online was justice bhat whenever my senior would ask me to research some some law point i would go running and find justice bhat in the he was not justice bhat then i would find him in the corridors of corridors of court and ask him just give me some precedent on this and and he would rattle out you know he had a he had an elephantine memory and he would rattle out those cases and i would go and impress my senior by saying ha huh, this versus this this versus this this versus this so thank you justice bhat for being here i deferred the acknowledgement because of that and also to say that you know nowadays there's a tendency what do you want from your senior you want contacts you want panels you want cases but i am so happy that my senior gave me people and that is very important and i acknowledge ms jay singh for that for not only giving me the the ability to dare to question and here i have to thank sumit malik because sumit malik just clarified you know that my trolls on social media keep saying that i uh, speak truth to power and inconvenient truth to power only because i have sour grapes but he is now clarified in 2008 also i was sour graping and asking truth to power because i was so upset that the supreme court was you know literally messing up with the labor law i wrote this article and i told sumit please publish it and he refused to publish it so then like everyone else had to turn turn to nagpur not that nagpur nagpur as in the rival nagpur publishing house and i can't name, name them because there are so many of them uh, the rivals sitting here so they published it and anyway coming back to what i was saying most importantly during covid this was a, a kind of tension release for me because i really wanted to uh, you know write something about law because i found that there was a overdose of webinars and everyone was doing webinars everyone was doing instagram cooking so what would i do and i also felt that it is time to also give back to the uh, to the you know we all get from the bar we all get so much and we have received so much i have received so much as a person who came to delhi with you know 5000 rupees in my pocket i have got so much from from this city from these people from my sweet punjabi friends who are sitting over there and and uh, so then i uh, i said that you know let me give back something to the legal community and i thought that you know parting with money is difficult and there are so many generous people who did part with money i parted with words it was easier 
So what I did was I wanted to make law and legal cases, legal history, legal trials, famous judges, famous litigants popular. And that's how I started writing this, you know, these several articles. As Nikhil, who's in the audience, said that there's a, you know, overdose of your articles. You know, we can't keep up with the reading uh, of your writing. And then I said, let me just, you know, I'm you know, spending so much time in COVID, and this was the first 40 days. I said, let me just write an autobiography. And there was a writer's block. So I said, let me write a fictional autobiography, and all the blocks went. <laughs> so uh, uh, I want to uh, thank the three Devi. Before that, I want to thank one Devi and then the three Devi. One Devi is Supriya Malik, the, the sister of Sumit Malik, and more importantly, my editor. She has handheld me through the whole process, even till last night when I said that you have made everyone create such a hype and made everyone pre-order, and then they will be so angry after they read what has happened, and they say, no, no, don't worry, it will not be that bad. <laughs> so more than editing, she has done the handhelding. And if you want your money back, you sue Eastern Book Company. I have got nothing. <laughs> OK? But seriously, I mean, uh, Mrs. Malik, Supriya's mom, was my first reader. In fact, I wanted to dedicate the book to her. Normally, people dedicate it to their family. And I, I said I wanted to dedicate it to her, but she said no. So it's dedicated to every struggling lawyer. And you know, I'll keep on rambling, so I'll, just, I, I'll, I'll wrap up in just one more minute. So this has been a very, very enlightening experience for me. I mean, I have found that there is a constitu constituency of young lawyers, young students, and it is important for us to take the message of law, the positive message of law. That law is such a powerful tool. Law is such a, you know, this whole jealous mistress crap has to end. And all this is law is very difficult for people to come in, outsiders to come in, only established families. This is not true. I mean, at least I can speak of Delhi. I can speak of where we are, our ecosystem. I mean, this is the most democratic ecosystem. All of us who are sitting in this panel, Akash is not a lawyer, so shut your ears are people without godfathers, are people without people backing. And if we can be here and be honored and acknowledged by all of you, that means that there is scope for everyone. And I, I'm speaking to everyone who, are, who couldn't be here in this packed hall, uh, who are listening by live streaming. Everyone has an ability to do well, and everyone has an ability to strive and make something for yourself. So there are two observations I want to make, and I want to end it, <clears throat> which I didn't think. Like, for example, when Akash was reading, I didn't think of it from this perspective. Actually, for us lawyers, what he said is all we know it. But when a non-lawyer reads it, he finds it very hilarious. We know the greatest respect, utmost respect part, right? But the non-lawyer will find it difficult, uh, will find it interesting. And that is the object of this book. It's not f so much for all of you, because you know what board collapsing is. So you won't collapse at a story of board collapse. But certainly, it'll be interesting but today, we are mainstreaming all these things. You know, we talk about why lawyers wear black. You know, this book has all these things, trivia put in here and there, so that, you know, it's, it's like that sugar coating the medicine. So please speak to all your people, people in your house who are not lawyers. They'll read this book, and they'll appreciate you better. I'm, I'm selling, hard selling while I'm speaking. <laughs> so to... to to end, uh, I, wa I, want to do, I want to make this one last point, <clears throat> and this was pointed out by Supriya in one of our hand-holding sessions two, three days back. And I, again, I was telling Supriya, Supriya, jada hype ho ja rahe. I'm, I, I'm getting a bad feeling, you know, poor people, some student is saying, I'm saving my uh, allowance and I'm going to buy a book, sir, and send it to Delhi for your signature. And someone from Pakistan is calling and saying, sir, I want to come to India and get a signature from you. I'm saying, you know, let's down the hype. Then Supriya said, see, what, you, know, do, you know, see this. In your book, you have written about such interesting, powerful women uh, lawyers, uh, women judges, women court staff. And, and actually, I, re I really didn't think of that, and, I, I, and that angle really struck me, that yes, willy-nilly, this book is actually a, a homage to the women. Uh, the women members of our bar, the women members of our court staff, who are not at all recognized as our equals even till date. And I hope that all of you read this, and it inspires a lot of lawyers, law students, to, to strive to break that glass ceiling. And, you know, I hope that Gorango in you will never, never give up and will achieve the excellence which all of you deserve. Thank you so much.
thank you so much mr ghos this was quite a speech i would now like to call upon mr akash again to begin with the panel discussion Ah, so it's okay. Huh? We'll do it. So, Justice Bhatt, let me just before we start, uh, uh, let me just issue a clarification. Uh, Sanjay has really been pumping me. Saying, "Puchho, puchho. Jo puchna hai, puchho. Ekdam, uh, ekdam viral kar denge." So, can so, I interrupt one minute? I'm sorry. Uh, Akash, I I assured Akash that if he says something amiss, <laughs> it'll only be six six months, and it'll, you know it'll pass <laughs> in a jiffy. So Akash said, "No, no, both 2000 ka option bhi hai na." <laughs> So I said that option is at the judge's hand, not your <laughs> hand. You can't say I'm choosing 2000 and not six months. But go ahead. Uh, no, so so you can use this. Not uh, enough, like kind of gravel kind of thing. So uh, anyway, seriously. Uh, so I do a lot of social media, and you pick up a lot. Um, uh, unlike mainstream media, social media is a two-way street. You get a lot of feedback. The feedback that we definitely get is there is a lot of loss of respect in every other institution. The two institutions that stand out is the army, the armed forces, and of course the judiciary. And of course, in the recent years, there have been questions over that. Would you say that the apex judiciary at this point of time actively has conversations over how the world is looking into the perspective, the image of the judiciary and what would the judiciary be thinking of doing at this point of time? So I'll address the elephant in the room first and foremost and would like your comments on that. I don't know whether I can speak for the judiciary. I think it would be unfair also if I speak for the judiciary. But we are part of a society and what a each institution at any point of time that you get to see is part of a context. So if you see that context, the judiciary that we see, and I'm speaking of, I, I can't be a representative, but if you're saying that the uh, judiciary is not aware of its image or, or what it is expected to do, I don't think that's correct. Uh, what is not visible, there is a lot which is not visible. And that uh, cannot be explained also. And and unlike other institutions or people in other institutions who can come out and speak and issue clarifications when there is, whenever there is a controversy or such, such like, uh, you can't expect judges to do that. Judges, as you said, speak through their judgment. So, so in that sense, we are, uh, the court as an institution is kind of hamstrung, but ultimately you have to see the work it does. And I think that is, that is the only thing that matters. The rest of it is all, is, is all perception. And today, perceptions seem to matter. Perceptions seem to matter. So I, I would say only this, that what is most important is the actual work that the courts do, rather than the perceptions which are, uh, which are the, the, uh, what, what is perceived of them. Sometimes it is positive, sometimes it's negative. Uh, I'm just going to follow that with a partial second question, of course, completely agree with you that uh, judgments can't be delivered at this point of time and you're not speaking for uh, the entire system. Uh, what I would love to know as, as somebody who follows all the latest tweets coming out of the courts, it's a very, very interesting universe. Besides a book like this, the only peak that's an outsider like me gets to the actual working of the court, the observations, the knickknacks, the nook choke you get to see them, hear them in the tweets, and ma'am is right here. Is there any expectation that we could have for the live streaming of the court functions? Because in terms of perspectives and misconceptions, I think one thing that would definitely clear the air is the live streaming of court proceedings. Any, any developments on that front or conversations happening? I really can't speak again for the institution. It's just that some courts have started live streaming, so and during COVID, uh, 
I won't say there was live streaming, but it was as open a port as any institution could have been. So that's there, that's out there. So in that sense, there has been a complete transformation. But if you ask me whether there is going to be live streaming and uh, of what kind of proceedings, I think we are looking into, we are peering into the, uh, what shall we say, crystal mm -hmm. at this point of time. There are many courts. I think the Orissa High Court, the Gujarat High Court, and some other high courts have live streamed. And I, I believe it has a very positive impact in the sense that people who live in far-flung areas, litigants who, and we are, we are talking of, uh, we, are, we are confined to cities, but high courts, the bulk of the litigation comes from the, you know, in the bigger high courts, and um, uh, Delhi High Court is an exception, but Allahabad High Court, or uh, let's say Orissa or Gujarat, bulk of the litigation comes from dis districts, smaller towns. So oftentimes, like in Rajasthan, people have to travel almost a thousand kilometers from some areas if they have to come to the high court and see what is happening. So live streaming in such cases can be very positive. So it has its positives, but it has its darker sides too. And that is the, the thing that you mentioned, a tweet. Uh, well, I don't follow tweets, I'm not on any social media, but the point is you can just pick up a, 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 a let's say a fragment from a court conversation and tweet it. Mm. You're, talk, you're in, living in an age of perceptions, this can magnify whatever you want to say. And that would not uh, be a complete picture. In fact, that fragment can be very dangerous. So if, if we are to uh, live stream, I would say that this has to be a conscious policy decision. Whoever is to take it uh, will have to take it, take all these factors into account. Ma'am, I don't need to put the question more. Uh, I'm sure you have very, very strong views as far as this is concerned. And of course, the world of perspective. Just to add to that, has the perception increased, stable, or decreased? It's OK. Uh, uh, let me uh, let me begin by answering the question on live streaming. Uh, maybe it'll give you the answer to the question that you raised. So it was more than uh, four years ago that on a petition filed by me, the Supreme Court in a reasoned judgment said that live streaming was akin to a fundamental right, the right to know. And uh, they also said in their judgment that its various advantages include the fact that law students would benefit a lot from being, uh, from being able to watch uh, lawyers argue in court and to be able to watch how judges question lawyers and how do lawyers respond. Uh, I don't know whether Sanjay has dealt with that in this book, but uh, you might know that when a lawyer comes out of law school, they may not have even seen the inside of a courtroom. They wouldn't even know what actually goes on in a courtroom. So these were some of the advantages that were claimed for live streaming. I, of course, filed the petition because I felt we live in the age of social media. It's an idea whose time has arrived. Insofar as tweets are concerned, we already see them today. Every single law portal is putting out tweets in real time. So I don't think that's a may. On the contrary, one of the reasons that propelled me to file this petition was that disinformation could be prevented because you and I would be able to see in real time what the court is actually saying. And so we would not then go on to misquote what the court is saying. Now you ask me whether the Supreme Court has suffered a lack of respect. What can I tell you if the Supreme Court fails to implement its own judgment for four years? What am I supposed to make of it? I was the litigant. The case was filed in the name of Indira Jai Singh. There's a reasoned judgment. And presumably, this judgment was supposed to come into effect immediately, subject only to the uh, approval by, uh, by the framing of rules. And till today, the Supreme Court has not framed those rules and has not live streamed. So if you ask me the question, I will say I'm disappointed. That, and I, I tell myself, if the Supreme Court can't 
implement its own judgments, then how will others respect the court? This is mm. one example. I've tried. I've written letters to the Chief Justice of India. I've written letters to the E-Committee. And the answer I get is, yes, it's under consideration. But under consideration for four years, I'm disappointed. OK. Uh, then there is a, a very interesting and very often quoted saying about young lawyers coming in. You mentioned how it's just hard work, no connections required. Earlier, it is always all work, no pay, some work, some pay, some work, lots of pay, no work, all pay. That's what they say about lawyers. Then do you, do you really think that that's the kind of perception that lawyers have today? The perception is that field And that is why you have the kind of people, the numbers who are literally joining this field. I think things have changed over the last 25 odd years as far as our profession is came, uh, concerned. Like when we came in, I was the first of the national schools, mm. first batches of the national schools who came in. I was the very first batch actually. Of course there was this issue that you know there's not much money in the profession, that this, that and the other. But we went to very good offices. Offices which taught you that you know, you will earn money o over the years, but in the, it's a very serious profession. So you need to learn a lot in the first few years. And the first five, seven, maybe even ten years is really, rather than acquiring an MD or a, a PhD or whatever that people do in other fields, you actually learn in the field and you're not expected to earn more money. So money, I have never believed, can be a motivation in this profession because it's too serious a profession for that. Money will come at the end of the day. And that's something I keep telling youngsters when they sort of, you know, wonder about money and corporate jobs and this, that, and the other, to say that, listen, you will earn a lot of money in this profession, much more than you ever need. But you will have to be patient. And you will earn that money only when you have learned a little bit. And right? you're saying schools don't matter which school you're coming out from, which law which school? Which law school? It certainly matters. It certainly matters. But it matters at the day when you enter the gates of the profession. Mm. After that, it doesn't. Even someone who doesn't manage to get into a top law school today, because it's very competitive. So there may be an excellent student who doesn't get into the CLAT because it's just a numbers game now. It's not like when we wrote, there were just some 50 people wrote and 50 people got in. Mm. Right? Today is a different world. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, therefore, Law schools matter. Law schools matter also for the kind of foundation you get. But anyone coming from any law school, in my view, if he's willing to put in the hours, he's willing to work hard, mm. willing to enjoy himself, I think you should learn to enjoy what you read. And I think sky is the limit. Sanjay, what is the one pers perspective that you always have encountered of people talking to you? They think about lawyers. I know that one thing that everybody says that lawyers are very slick. You have to be very careful of what you tell them. Besides that, what is the one ridiculous perception about lawyers? That you're like, no, that's not true. It's like on YouTube, I can tell you, it's like everybody thinks you're rolling in a lot of money. I'm like, dude, mother, sister, boldo, don't say that you're rolling in a lot of money. But that's simply not true. So what is the one very, very irritating thing about the legal profession that people have made up their minds on, which is completely not true? Well, I think it's from the day of Shakespeare that we, we are suffering this, uh, you know, misfortune. Because Shakespeare said, let's kill all the lawyers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, uh, well I, 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 I would say in a different way. Let's see it in a different way. Uh, there was a time uh, in the 1990s when if some child went and told his mother or father, as Gorango does his parents and his relatives, see, I'm pitching my book even while answering his question. So successful that, author, that, that's what makes a successful that author. That daddy, I want to do law, the father mm -hmm. would have a heart attack. So today, the father and the mother are saying, Beti, law karo, law karo, you know, go coaching me jao. Now today, I'm told that NCLAT coaching is a billion dollar business. And as Diane said, that, you know, like, that, that I forced my daughter to uh, do this, she wasn't interested, and she came back with a 29,000 rank, and she was very happy, she didn't care, she doesn't want to be a lawyer. Mm. But it is, 
the fact that parents are opening up to wanting their children to be lawyers means that somewhere law is getting respectability. Now it is your guess whether the respectability is coming because people are saying we are earning a lot of money or whether the respectability is coming because people think that lawyers are uh, uh, force multipliers, social engineers, bringing change to society. Your guess is as good as mine. But the normal perception, and everyone should not have the perception, even the Hindi movies are changing the perception, Nakash. That whole Damini, Tariq, Tariq, Tariq is going. So now you have very sophisticated movies like Court, and you have on OTT, you have all these, uh, uh, these new uh, serials coming where they actually show properly how legal proceedings happen. Jeb Heem is an example. And since I've put a lot of my relatives under the bus, mm -hmm. and my parents are watching from Calcutta, let me put my father under the bus. My grandfather, the maternal grandfather is from, uh, from Delhi. And when my father got married to my mother, my grandfather thought, he, instead of dowry, let me give him a chance of a century. He took him to watch what my grandfather thought was the greatest legal proceeding of India ever. In court number one, Keshwananda Bharati was being argued, one of those normal days, and my father almost dozed off. <laughs> so, <laughs> my grandfather had to wake up my father and take him out of the courtroom. Mm. So, that's the, but that is changing, there's a perception, while the pub, general public is accepting that courts are not as dramatic as in Hindi movies, yet they are accepting it's not as boring as actually it, in, it is in reality. So, it is a work in progress. And you made a very, very interesting comment about saying that how things have changed now. So you are of the opinion that it is not an incestuous world anymore. You can be talented without a godfather, without a family member in the profession and still make it big? I would say, you know, I would say, and here I was, I was talking with Justice Bhatt also, and if, if he may permit me to, uh, you know, betray the confidence and share this. Like in Hindi movies, so you also have children of lawyers who also face a kind of discrimination because they are viewed from the fact that, oh, his father is a lawyer. Hai. Mm. So it's, it's, not even, it's not always easy for them either. So it's not that it's always that a discrimination is of the first generation lawyer and the child of a, of, of a, of a, son, a son or a daughter of a judge or a lawyer or a senior lawyer has it easy. It's not so. Mm. As Dayan said, yes, it opens the door at the beginning. But then, let's be very clear, I mean, I can speak from Delhi, I've hardly practiced anywhere else. In fact, again, I'm pushing my sales of my book. I've never practiced in Calcutta, so the entire story of Calcutta, the whole first part of the book is all from mind. I've practiced in Delhi and I can tell about my court, other than making fun of my bong names or the way we bongs use certain words, I have never ever faced any discrimination in, in our high court, in the Delhi high court. Mm -hmm. And that's a matter of pride for me. I have no judge, no lawyer. I mean, I've only been showered with love and affection and recognition. And I'm a first generation. So I would say that no. I mean, it's all up to you how you, you know, you make of it. Sure. Justice, but I uh, want your uh, personal comments on this, your observation. One very, very good thing that happened recently was the kind of dressing down that was given over this whole Taj Mahal case that came up. And it was made very clear that don't make a mockery of this whole PIL system and don't come up like this. Go to a university, do your studies and come back. When we see these sort of cases come up in court, take a lot of expensive court time also. And then on the other hand, we see that there is so much of lag. In your opinion, what can be done when such frivolous cases come up? Can there be some sort of penalization to prevent these sort of instances from happening again? Because it seems everybody is pandering to their own agenda and going to the court and wasting a lot of precious court time as well. I don't know whether the analogy would be apt, but you know, there are certain things which we have to live with. Mm. I would say suffer also. Because the remedy can be worse than the disease. Now, why did uh, public interest litigation or PIL get introduced? It was meant to be uh, the channel for the most oppressed, those who are not visible, those who could not approach the court. So public-minded people would approach on their behalf. So it was more of social interest. And then it expanded to other fields. Instead of workers of Asia or bonded laborers or people who are not seen, whose rights have to be agitated like prisoners, etc., it went on to other fields like environment. Mm. It, it, it went into urban planning, and, and the like. And then it has taken the shape that it has today. 
and yet i think it is important that and there have been effort uh, attempts by certain judgments and i would say the judgments of the supreme court to streamline this but at the same time there has to be an extreme caution in this because the jurisdiction of the courts high court and the supreme court is of the widest mag uh, amplitude now you can't uh, you know bind it down by rules there can be certain kinds of broad principles which evolve through judgments but if you try to legislate as it were mm. in the form of rules you will be constraining so therefore this call is ultimately taken by the judges and they get through their work and much of the judges work is drudgery as you say uh, the kind of uh, we are talking of perceptions that the commonest perception even today is that the judge leads a very cushy life because he just comes between 10 to 4 well just ask yourself the question that if you were to argue an, a matter for a, a, a case an important case for you concerning a property which has run into volumes and go, con, come through the you know rungs of layers of litigation for about four days do you think that the judge can deliver judgment in a jif jiffy so where is all that effort mm. the real work begins in the evening the real work begins in the evening after the judge returns to her chambers so the work of reading the cases preparing for the next day reading the cases which have been reserved for judgment in fact some of the uh, more complex judgments are written during the vacation so this this aspect is never brought i mean it's not been that's one of the constraining factors of being a judge so likewise there are several of these misconceptions now you can't uh, legislate away a class of litigation which is generally for the public so will restrain restrain the powers of the court it is rather that let the courts do the choosing like in that case I'll, I'll just follow that up with another one because it's a question of perception and huge huge massive step by the supreme court as far as the sedition issue is concerned uh, yes putting it on a pause not scrapping it totally but i i just want to know from you as a personal point of view is that I mean, you know, a very common comment I get out of my, uh, on my YouTube channel is, tum par sedition ka case lag jayega. I'm stating facts, questioning the government, but people would believe that, no, this is a fit case for sedition. In your personal opinion, do you think that we have made a mockery of the sedition law by implementing it in the most ridiculous of circumstances? Well, you're asking me to make a, make a political comment and I'll refrain from it. But I'll say this generally, that we have come across in the recent past and that speaks volumes of the society we live in. And that the kind of uh, what we are today, the systems that we have, is our own product. So you can't place the blame. Of course, there is someone responsible. Now, a person in power in the past may have used it in a certain degree. Likewise, I'll, I'll take a new, more neutral example, defamation. You're a journalist, defamation. Does it, do those defamation cases really stick? Likewise, there are any, any number of uh, branches of the law which are deployed. I would use, a, use the word deployed because that is what it is, deployed. Now, that's a tendency which we as a society have to address. I'm putting it in a larger sense because we can't, we can't, I, I would not like to make a comment because A, th this is a matter seized off by the court, yeah. B, it has political repercussions, so I don't, don't want to, get, I want to stay away from it. But I want to say this, that there are, there have been these instances and we have to address it as a society. What does it mean? That your freedoms don't come free, they are not, never free, you have to work for it. Liberties are, as they say in one of those series or movies, it's not a free, I mean, it's not a free, a free lunch that you have. You have to work for it. Sure. How are we working for it? Hmm. That, that, of course, that's a question that we have to ask ourselves also. Indra Jai Singh, what I want to know from you is with the state of the opposition that is there today, with the state of the institutions that there are, we are today, 
expectations that you have seen from the legal fraternity, from the courts, from the advocates that people would be looking up at least in this area over, over the last few years? Okay. If you don't mind, I'd like to take up on the question that you asked uh, Justice Bhatt, uh, because he said he didn't want to answer it because it was political. I'd like to give it a bit of a legal color. Uh, you know, there is a concept in law that just because a law is misused, it doesn't become unconstitutional. Now, you and I were discussing before this conversation began that we seem to be suffering from a poverty of language and imagination. I do not like the word misuse, okay? What I believe is it is being used in the manner in which the enforcement agencies want to use it, okay? So let's abandon this theory that just because a law is being misused, it doesn't make it unconstitutional. What I think is that the use of laws, such as sedition, such as creating communal disharmony, such as the use of the ED, or such as the use of the CBI, has been elevated to the level of a policy. It's not what we normally call an aberration. You, you know, Justice, but we have this ability to call something that happens an aberration. But my question is that when an aberration happens day after day after day after day, can you call it an aberration? Then you can't. Then you have to call it a policy. Now got to come to and therefore become subject to judicial review. It's a policy of abuse of process that we are witnessing in the country today. Mm. And I think it's a big challenge before the judiciary. How are you going to deal with this abuse of laws which is elevated to the level of a policy? And uh, I think your other question was... Are, to, are people do, looking Yes. Up. I, okay, I want to say this loud and clear institutions and the collapse of institutions. We all know that institutions have collapsed and I don't wish to repeat it. But I believe that the battles of the future are going to be fought in courtrooms. So, just as Mrs. Gandhi had to lose her prime ministership because of a court judgment, I believe that lawyers have to rise to the occasion and take these battles to a court of law. So I think Courts are going to be very, very important institutions in the future. It's now entirely in the hands of the court to make or break our democratic system. I don't believe, I'm sorry to say this, although I don't want to, that I don't see a united opposition doing it. Mm. I don't see uh, new and emerging political forces doing, doing this. I don't see coalitions doing it. But I do see a group of very, very enthusiastic young lawyers in this country, and I salute them. I salute them. The, the manner in which they rose to defend the accused of the Delhi riots, the way in which they have taken these sedition cases to court, the fact that they have fought every single lynching case, the fact that they've brought every single one of these issues to the doors of the Supreme Court, it's nothing less than a revolution. So I see a very big role for the judiciary in the years to come. If democracy is going to survive in this country, it is entirely up to the courts to ensure that it survives. Absolutely. Sumit, you have seen so much, reported so much. I, I want to know, I, I want to know from the record aspect of it, okay. we hear a lot of criticism, of course, but then you see what is happening with the American Supreme Court. And you see that they are going back in time. That's the allegation, the whole abortion issue at this point of time. So do we have a far more progressive judicial system, judicial system than many other countries at this point of time? It's something that do we tend to overlook uh, there have been a lot of positive judgments as well over the last few years. Uh, I'm not really sure if I'm the right person or qualified enough to answer it. But if we were to look at how the jurisprudence has evolved, and if we were to look at just one concept which started as uh, procedure established by law, 
So Article 21 says that no person shall lose their, uh, can be deprived of their life of liberty without procedure established by law. And when the uh, Constituent Assembly debates were going on, the American concept of due process was debated. However, it was not brought into the Constitution. But if we were to look at how the jurisprudence has evolved from 1950 to date, that slowly has changed from procedure established uh, by law to due process. And that is now being sort of specially under the ambit of Article 21, uh, has been widened not just in terms of a person's life and liberty in the very literal sense, but has changed to so many aspects of our life and liberty. And, and of course, uh, the Puttaswamy case being the latest in that series, where now privacy uh, is a fundamental right. So uh, to that extent, as a chronicle of the Supreme Court and looking at how it has progressed, yes, I would say that, that there has been dramatic change from 1950. And today, uh, the court looks at so, so many aspects of life and liberty, from whether it is the environment, uh, and, and there are just so many examples, and there are so many cases over this period how the, the whole jurisprudence has changed. Uh, Shonjai, to the young folks, because I don't know, somehow you think you have a lot of young followers. I don't know why, because you're on Twitter or something, because of that. <laughs> but I do see this passion that you want to, and I remember, you know, having this dinner and you always have this very infectious energy. Um, and you want to give back something which is very, very clear. Uh, do bail me out when my time comes. Uh, that, that would be a good give back. Um, but to the younger ones who are watching, you've made a mark, you are happy, you've attained something, you want to give back. To them, what would you say? Because one thing is, you, you then talked about patience. Who has patience today? So. Would you see a lot of your colleagues, your younger colleagues, try to quicken their way through, or that's always been the case? Well, so far as your bail is concerned, you should look at Mr. Krishnan. He's a criminal lawyer. I'm a labor lawyer, so. <laughs> they, they make me do bail. hard labor. <laughs> Anyways, uh. Well, uh, uh, on a more serious note, so far as, uh, yes, so far as young lawyers are concerned, and I think uh, Diane also said that, that the in our generation, we had a lot of patience, or we were forced to have a lot of patience. But let's be frank, in our generation, we, we paid 700 rupees for three trimesters in law school, the national law schools, today they're playing in lakhs. Mm. They're taking student loans. So it's very uh, easy, very easy for us to say that have patience, but well, we have to recognize these things in, in, in the legal community that the salaries of young juniors are woefully low. When I came to uh, Delhi, I found that one of the India's top lawyers had a junior who was working for free. And I just couldn't imagine why would the lawyer work for free. And then I was told that because he's getting the privilege of working in that person's chamber, that he's working for free. So that has to change. Uh, you, you, we have to make this aspect has to be dealt with. That, you know, in a lawyer's office, even now, sadly, the clerk makes more than a lawyer who's gone through national law school, spent, spent lakhs in becoming a graduate. But at the same time, I would say that our system takes time to change. So please, as Dayan again said, I keep falling back on Dayan because even I'll need the bail from him. Uh, please have faith that ultimately, ultimately, maybe once you are giving your labor into the profession, ultimately the rewards are such that uh, you know, you'll have much more than you can even count. Then would you be able to name three best pro bono lawyers who are recognized and known to give some amazing service for free? Or that's not a breed anymore, or that's a dying breed? See, first of all, the <coughs> concept of pro bono is an obligation for every lawyer under our rules. Right? And many lawyers do pro bono work. Of course, they're not on social media. Mm. They're not telling the world that I've done pro bono work. They're not taking a selfie before a court and said, sir, I've appeared in a matter free today. Right? So I am not here to give lists, which is dangerous when it comes to our profession. People have obligations. They will learn in the profession what they have to do, and they will do it. Because this whole concept of saying, I'm a pro bono lawyer, I'm a rights lawyer, I'm a this lawyer, I'm a that lawyer is wrong. You must be a lawyer. You mm. must do your work. You get a, a client who, you cannot, who cannot afford you, of course you will do pro bono. 
And that is something, I, it's a message I want to tell the younger bar. That please do everything that comes your way. On whatever jurisdiction comes your way, whatever you have to do free, please do free. Mm. But please do not market yourself in a particular sort of genre to say, I'm, I'm a rights lawyer, I'm a free lawyer, I'm this lawyer and that lawyer. It's, it's detrimental to the profession as a whole and belittles the seriousness of our profession, which is my greatest concern, mm. which I find with many people the lack of seriousness. And today, please understand, we are in a post-liberalized legal profession. When I mean post-liberalization legal profession, is a profession which has grown commercially after the opening of the Indian economy. So it's a profession with huge potential in all kinds of work. 90% of the work we all do is commercial work, mm. which means what? It means Everyone coming into this profession today has a lot of opportunity. Not only an opportunity to make money, of course they do, but an opportunity to learn and learn so many diverse areas of work, of commerce, of you know, uh, general litigation. There is just too much and too few lawyers in my view, too few serious lawyers. You want to have a quick one? No, no, I think Ms. Jessing. Yeah, yeah. Can, before uh, I yeah. One quick word. From what, Di see, that Dayan doesn't like self-publicity, but let me tell you, he did the entire Nirbhaya case for a one rupee. He's also been involved in the Skipper Towers case where he's worked for, for years for those flat owners. He's still working for the Uphar uh, tragedy people for free. I'm, it's not a publicity for Dayan. What I mean yeah. is, there are a lot of lawyers who are working for free, and there I'll say, they don't publicize. And the model we follow, and I've learned from Ms. Jai Singh, is the model of cross-subsidy. Maybe ma'am will speak about that. First, I'd like to make my own uh, point of view clear. I, I believe that young lawyers who come out of uh, our various law schools who want to do uh, what we call, I prefer to call it legal aid work. I don't want to call it pro bono work. Mm -hmm. And we have an amazing system of legal aid in the country. We have a national legal aid services. We have state legal aid services. I don't understand why these young lawyers are not employed by our legal aid boards and paid a good, decent salary. Why are they expected to work for free? That is my question. Why is somebody expected to work just pro bono? If by pro bono you mean work free of charge, you know, I will tell you there is no shortage of money in the legal aid services. If anybody took the trouble to find out, you would see that they've got a huge amount of unspent budgets. Now, why is this money not spent to engage lawyers who are coming out of law schools? No doubt they will need guidance. They can be under the supervision of a senior. Sure. Pay them. Pay them well. Let them do two, three years of what you would consider national service and then go on into a private practice. That is possible. That, I think, is the model of the future. Apart from that, yes, I agree. I myself started in my legal practice on what he described as a cross-subsidy model. Uh, people ask me, so many lawyers ask me, oh, Ms. J. Singh, how do you manage to do the things you do? Because I laid down certain ethical guidelines for myself. I will not represent a rapist against a victim. In fact, I don't represent employers, I represent employees, and I laid down these guidelines for myself. I have been told, oh, you're violating the cab rank rule. So be it. I don't know if you know what the cab rank rule is. We're supposed to take every case which comes our way. But I have not done that. I have chosen my work. But I keep telling them, look, I have made money in the legal profession. I have been paid. I consider myself a successful lawyer. And if I can be a well-paid, successful human rights lawyer, so can you. And one of the greatest compliments that my own junior paid to me, I'd like to repeat that. He said, ma'am, I've seen you work harder and better on your pro bono cases than you work on your paid cases. Now, there can be no greater compliment than that, mm. I think. So it's the quality of the work that you turn out. 
when you do pro bono, and this is what I believe, that when you do pro bono, you just have to work better and better and better. And that's what I would agree with Dayan, the motivation is not money. There is, there is a cause to be represented. One sentence I cannot resist from saying, Sanjay uh, said it in his uh, opening statement. He said, Mrs. Malik said about this book, this book, she said reading it brings tears and a smile to her. Now what happened to the tears? Can we forget the tears and remember only the smile? So I would like to combine the two statements, one made by Ravi Bhatt and one made by Mrs. Malik when she said, tears and smiles, tears for the pathetic state in which this profession is functioning and smiles for what Ravi, uh, sorry, Justice Bhatt referred to as uh, the style of writing is compassionate. And if we can combine these two things, compassion with smile and tears. I think, Sanjay, in that case, your book would have done its job. <laughs> okay. Uh, to, towards, towards the end, I'd like to push my luck a little bit more, sir. Uh, Justice, but there is a lot of effort uh, and writing that has gone into the whole aspect of when does one become a judge, the whole shifting uh, as a lawyer who then decides to take on the judgeship. It's also a very fascinating aspect of this book. What, what, really, what really takes uh, to, to, to take on such a profession where you have to measure your words as you are, where you have to measure where you go, who you meet, where you sit? Then why do it? Because obviously the money tap is lesser, far lesser than any lawyer would earn. So what is, this is a very fascinating aspect for somebody who is not in the legal circle of this whole shift from the legal profession or as a lawyer going into judgeship. I'll, I'll, before I answer that question, I think I would give my own version of what the previous speakers have spoken. I think they've all spoken of certain truths as they see it. When Diane spoke of there being enough work, I think he refers to Delhi, he refers to Bombay, he refers to Bangalore. When he talks of there being a lot of money, again he's speaking of these large cities. If you go to smaller cities, which are tier two cities, or further smaller cities, towns, there will be a lot of lawyers. So there is a lot of disparity. And I don't agree with Ms. Jai Singh that uh, lawyers I mean, legal service lawyers are not paid. They are paid. Uh, but the, again, it's a matter of perception. People do not want to be at, at different. And secondly, would, would a client who has no option, except a client who has no option, people don't turn to legal aid. The perception of legal aid is legal aid for the poor is poor legal aid. Okay. Now, that perception, there's been a turnaround, hopefully, because a lot of work has been done. And a lot of these young lawyers are trained. And this kind of training is a standardized training, which is uh, you know, given in capsules. And we have you know, paralegal volunteers uh, who are fanning across the districts, etc. But the fact remains that the legal profession, uh, in the legal profession, whether it is in a district court or in the highest court, there, are, there is only ultimately a, a clutch of lawyers who make it big. So that disparity is massive, number one. The, num the second uh, perception, which I mean, uh, observation which I would like to make is, uh, I, I mean, I belong to a generation, so every generation thinks that it had the best. I don't know what Ms. Jessing sees, uh, feels that, but definitely uh, she has her own experience being a pioneer of another kind. And she has broken those barriers and, uh, I mean, she, it's been probably a most difficult uh, profession for her to reach where she has uh, but younger younger women have had it better although although there are barriers but coming back to uh, the point I wanted to make was there was mentoring when we were younger junior uh, seniors made it a point to take out time and educate their juniors I don't know how many seniors are able to do that or willing to do that they, the, 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 the thought that I get is that 
it's hardly there or it's there in very few places it's very important that if you want to give back you do it through the profession you teach the youngsters because there is there are two sides to being a senior one is that you are asking them to work for which i i think sanjoy and uh, dayan both have made a point and i totally agree with it there have to be standards as to the kind of uh, pay or a salary which has to be paid if a boy or girl has to survive in the profession in the initial years you just can't live on you know thin air and hope that you know sometime you'll do well yes there has to be you have to keep your body and soul together and plus some more these days but most important one of the seniors when i was drifting around said this that you need this kind of mentoring and somebody to uh, guide you more for moral support mm. now that i think is coming undone there the, the, that's the second part uh, yes legal aid systems have to be strengthened it has it's a continuous process but what i want to say about the profession is the perception that is uh, that all of us have here or maybe when we speak on in the media here that all of them are doing well or that there's lots to go around is not correct it's just not correct that's that's one now coming to the question that you put to me uh, well what makes you becoming a judge well, ultimately what what uh, what made say, made me say and i didn't hesitate hmm. what made made me say yes when i was in the threshold i, I had started doing very well i wanted to become what sanjoy and dayan have become dayan earlier and sanjoy recently a senior counsel okay. at that point of time i was told by advised by another senior that it's better to meet some senior judge and ask his opinion whether it's appropriate mm. so i asked him uh, asked an appointment he said you review come over and in, in on a weekend he was a, a well known friend so instead of that the next day the chief justice of the high court called me and said would you like to be a judge now uh, it is a decision which it can be you know it's a very momentous decision and i didn't consult my wife <laughs> i said yes now thinking back i think what really uh, made me say yes was this as a lawyer and i have done i mean i won't like to as he says advertise but most of my career initial career for 10 or 12 years was this penniless clients you know lawyer uh, labor labor dismissed workmen those who were waiting for their pension uh, salaried people who were facing disciplinary inquiry or the seniority or 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 the like so the sometimes you you barely get the expenses so it was not that it was a love of the profession which kept you on and of course there were rewards as sanjoy said there were as you went along there were clients who were able to pay and then you cross subsidized so if you like the profession and if you like the law there's a lot lot to it and what really made me say yes was this that as a lawyer maybe you can make a difference in two cases or three but as a judge you will certainly make case, a, a difference in six or seven cases and for each of those incremental cases it's a 100% sure. so the man who wins or the woman who wins that case wins it 100% so that is what really made me say yes that's that's amazing um so before we wrap up uh a round of crystal ball gazing about the perception starting with you ma'am um what are we now going to have in terms of perspectives about conceptions in the coming let me put a ballpark to it two years i think uh, i can only say i think perception of the judiciary will get better and better because i told you that uh, challenges that they will face will get better and better i am an optimist i believe that judiciary will rise to the challenge uh -huh. sure. perception and i am not talking only about the courts i am also talking about advocates and lawyers as well i am a struggling lawyer so i can't say bad things about <laughs> courts so i have to say good things <laughs> no but perception in two years see, see we as i said we are a colonial profession uh, it's gone on for years uh, it's taken us uh, as justice bhatt is here 
uh, he actually asked people, please don't call me Lordship. And the first thing we did is we called him and, and said, how could you do this to us? And you may find it odd as to why lawyers would be ap angry that the judges are saying, don't call us Lordships. It's because we are so used to using Lordship as an interval. When I'm trying to think from one thought to the other, you keep saying, my Lord, my Lord. It's not you're showing colonial respect to the judge. We are using it as a, yeah, as, as there is just now said, it's a breath catcher. So, you know, we are a very change-averse change profession. So I'm sorry, this is not your YouTube where every week something changes. Our profession in the next two years is not going to change. Except that Dayan will make more money. That is all I can foresee. Uh, and Dayan, about the money part, just, just coming uh, back to the whole money part. Uh, when you hear about these fantastical uh, yeah. uh, rates that the top lawyers uh, charge, does that damage the perception? Or that's part of the game. If you want a top lawyer, then you pay that kind of money. But I want to, before I answer all these difficult questions, because there are much richer lawyers sitting in this room, like Mohit Mathur, so he may not want me to talk about the fees he makes. So I'm saying something else. You know, I want to tell you an anecdote about a great author. So we're talking about cross-subsidy, making money, no, etc. Time is over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's this judge who met us in some social occasion and took me aside and said, you know, Sanjoy, I'm so sorry, it's about you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> he does so much work for the poor, he does so much work for labor, he does this thing. Does he make his, make ends meet? And hello, I had come to that event in his new Mercedes. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know, Okay, that's the profession for you. You will have difficult times, you will have hard times, you will have struggles. Without that, you will have no story. And of course, you'll make money. And if somebody is making more money, please, this is a profession where one thing my great senior, my privilege to work with, taught me, is one thing you should never have is envy. Don't look ahead of the man who's owning an S-Class Mercedes. Look back, there are people much worse off than you. And this is the message I want to give the younger bar. Be positive, be happy, and be serious. That's all you need. And certainly one day you will be him. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? <laughs> you wanted to, you wanted to put, put, put a quick point? I already told you I make good money, so I have nothing more to add. <laughs> uh -oh. Do we have time? I have to work also, no, for a living. <laughs> if I reveal to you the financial terms of this book, you won't ask this question. Uh, Justice, but uh, final words. Final words. Yeah. Well, about about the future, about how you are seeing as far as perception and uh, conceptions are concerned. I don't know about uh, what what kind of crystal gazing we can do, but I think that the quotes that uh, we see today. Uh, the kind of functioning that we see in the courts, there has to be a change. Because the oft, oft quoted phrase, or oft you, often used phrase, colonial, the colonial method or, or system of functioning, where you have almost inten, you know, interminable you know, submissions and arguments and adjournments at the asking, and uh, I mean, if everything that that is that we see as drawbacks, which uh, result in pendency of cases for long periods. Yes. Now, the way to go is to change the way we function, and that change has to come from all of us. Uh, uh, we have to use, we have to innovate methods to shorten making of submissions, ensure that cases are fast tracked. There are systems in place in every court now, and, 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 and lawyers also discipline themselves so that you speak less so in order to get more cases and make more money, perhaps. <laughs> so the, the, the message that I would say is we have to start thinking, how would courts be 25 years hence? Now, are we able to visualize that kind of a courtroom? We saw, we saw a disruption.
two years, last two years, is that disrupt that that disruption has made a difference, and it is staying. Now, are we going to take it, build on it? And if we are, what what are we going to do about it? How are we going to change our profession? How are we going to change the way we function? I think that is a very important task. Apart from the sensational cases that you come across and hear, there are these volumes and, and, and piles and piles of loads of litigation where people have been waiting for long. It's, and I think it's time that we all put our thinking caps together and, and agree that there are certain things which we need not do and there are certain things that we must do. That's my message. Thank you so much, lady and the gentleman. Thank you so much. This was quite an evening. We hope everyone who came here on a Sunday evening feels it was well worth the effort. I would like to thank Justice Bhatt for agreeing to be the chief guest for the evening. Ms. Jay Singh and Mr. Krishnan for agreeing to be panelists. Mr. Akash Banerjee for hosting a wonderful discussion. The author for writing the book and for trusting us at Isun Book Company to be his publishers. To the EBC team, Ms. Supriya Malik for editing the book and putting together the book in its present form. Mr. Ashish Boyne, the illustrator who visualized Gorongo and some of the other characters from the book that you see on the cover. The proofreaders and DTP operators who converted a manuscript into a book, the, the production team who ensured that this high quality production came to life, the sales and marketing team who will truly take Gorongo to the people. Finally, I would also like to thank Bhumika and Prachi who alongside me put together this event. And last but not the least to the wonderful audience who have been with us on this occasion. We are also glad that Mr. Raghav Chadha, Member of Parliament and Spokesperson of the National, Exec and National Executive Member of Aam Aadmi Party, took out time to be with us for this event. With this, I would like to declare the end of this event. Panelists and guests, please proceed to the garden area for refreshments. Thank you.